Matthew chapter 16, we'll begin reading in verse 13. And the Bible says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Now let me just pause right here. Uh, they claimed he was John the Baptist for his cleansing. They claimed he was Elijah for his praying. They claimed he was Jeremiah for his weeping. They claimed he was others for his message. There's a lot of people giving you opinion on who they think Jesus is, but my dear friends, as Brother Ron said, you can know who he is. Hmm? Let's read on. Verse 15, He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. By the way, they'll never know who Jesus is until they accept him and the Father reveals it to them. Hmm? Yeah. You didn't know anything about Jesus till you got born again either. You heard about him, you put your faith in him, and then all of a sudden a whole new world opened up to you, huh? Old hymn writer wrote, I'm living in a brand new world, huh? In verse 18, he goes on and says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We sure do thank you for the good singing. Lord, our hearts were uplifted by the words of all the songs that testify to the greatness of God. Lord, we thank you for the good testimonies. Lord, how you hear and answer prayer. God, how you bless people and how you've been good to people. And God, we thank you, Lord, for all the good testimonies. We thank you for reading of the Word of God. Lord, we know as we sit here, most of the people in the world do not have a copy of the Word of God. And yet we got to read a passage of it just a few minutes ago. Now, Father, I pray that, Lord, you would truly enlighten our minds tonight, challenge our hearts. Lord, I pray you'd bless. I pray you'd uh, 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 move throughout the, the, the service now. I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Help uh, my words to be the very words of God. Speak to hearts and may everyone draw closer to God. Bless those that are working with the children. Bless those that are working with the teens. Uh, Lord, protect those young people. Protect their minds. Protect what they're exposed to. And God, I pray they would be enlightened with truth right now. And Lord, I pray any that haven't reached the age of accountability, the word of God be sunken deep in their heart when they reach that age. Uh, Lord, they'd accept you as a young, at a young age. And those that have been uh, uh, reached that age and haven't accepted you, I pray that maybe even tonight, Lord, they trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Bless now, speak to hearts, get glory to your name, use this unworthy vessel. We'll thank you for it, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. And amen. I, I just want to look at a couple things. I want you to notice, first of all, the definitive of these verses. Verse 16, And Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's not up for debate. He is Christ. He is the Son of the living God. And He's alive and well tonight. If you don't believe that, you can't be saved. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's already uh, uh, defined in the annals of heaven. Nothing will ever change that. I'm glad he is my God. He's my Christ. He's my Savior, and he's my Lord tonight. Uh, we see the definitive. Now, notice the directive. Look at verse 18. This is a greatly misunderstood verse because people don't know English. Part of knowing English is you've got to know how to break down sentences. And can I be real honest with you? When I was in high school, I hated that. Huh? I wanted something where, you know, I loved history because, you know, you learned about wars and people getting killed. Now, I, I, I'm, you know, that was a good deal, huh? 
Uh, I, I, I enjoyed shop class because you got to take wood and run through machines and do stuff to it and make stuff and everything. Uh, I really enjoyed drafting class and designing things. I loved that, you know. And I was a big mathematician. I loved math, man. I used to, I could do algebra my brain and now I can't even remember my name. I mean, I don't understand all this stuff. It happens with age. Uh, but there's one thing that I did not like. I did not like English where you diagram a sentence. Now, I loved uh, 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 taking English class where, you, where you, you studied Shakespeare and you studied all that. So I loved that stuff. But you get me down to where i got to break down adverbs and, and you got to, you know, what is an adverb, nouns and pronouns and verbs and um, where you break down the sentence and what the, what's uh, the verb, you know, doing and all. I was like, check me out, man. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Huh? But you know what I appreciate right now? Understanding English, how to break down sentences and know what it's saying. Right. You know, as we sit here tonight, there's some 300 different religions and denominations in America. And you know why? Because they've taken the Word of God and taken portions out that they wanted to believe, but they did not rightly divide the Scriptures. And most of them have changed the Scriptures to fit what they believe instead of taking the Lord at what He said. Now look in verse number 18. I want to break this down for you so you understand it. The Bible, this is Jesus speaking to, to Peter. He said, I say also unto thee. And whenever the Lord speaks to you, you better be listening. Yes. Now notice what he says. He says, thou art Peter, comma. That breaks the sentence. That puts a pause. He looks at him and says, thou art Peter. We all good? You got that? Yes. Then he pauses. Now look at the next phrase. And upon this rock I will build my church, semicolon. He says, Thou art Peter, pause. And then he says, But upon this rock I will build my church. On the rock that I am the Son of the living God. I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. I am the rock. On this rock I will build my church. There's a lot of folks, in particular the Catholics, got it all wrong. They thought he was saying, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. No, uh, he didn't build the church on Peter. Uh, Peter was a little stone. That's what Peter means. Uh, uh, the rock of ages is Jesus. Uh, he's the chief cornerstone. Uh, he's the one that the church is built upon, not Jesus. He said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church myself. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, there's a lot we can take from this directive. Hmm? Peter's a blessing, but he's limited. Jesus is unlimited. The church is built upon him. Matter of fact, Paul wrote that if any man lay any other foundation than what's been laid, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he's building on things that won't last. And he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And listen, the gates of hell prevailed against Peter. The Lord told him, said, uh, Satan desired thee to sift thee as wheat. And he said, uh, and I prayed for thee that thy faith faileth not. But then he goes on to say, but when thou art converted, uh, go and tell, tell to your brethren. And what he's saying is, uh, Peter, the devil's coming against you. He's going to have his way with you. You know who the devil's never had his way with? Jesus. The gates of hell will not prevail against the Lord Jesus Christ. huh? Can I say the gates of hell are not borders but barriers uh, 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 that attempt to fence in the church. Uh, uh, hell wants to push us off in a little corner, bind us in by these barriers uh, and tell us we can't testify uh, in public. We can't pray in public. We can't preach in public. We can't witness in public. Uh, 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 can I say the devil is a master at intimidating people uh, and he wants to intimidate you uh, so he can manipulate you uh, for the sole purpose that he wants to dominate you. Uh, but I've got good news. Uh, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. Uh, hey, uh, we're to charge the gates of hell uh, and the Lord will bust them down and we're to take the gospel to whosoever will. We see the directive. We see the definitive. Now notice, if you will, the dissertation. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now he says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. 
And when you get that down, and you are willing to be what I want you to be, then I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you bind on earth, or bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so he gives a dissertation. Now, if you want to be a little church that crawls over in the corner, never does anything, let the gates of hell prevail, verse 19 doesn't apply to you. You don't get the keys. But if you want to impact your world and make a stand against the wiles of the devil, well, you're right where I want you to be. Here's the keys to the kingdom of heaven. With God's help, I want to preach on that very thought. The keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, can I say the book of Matthew is not written to the church. It's written to the Jews. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is displayed as the king of glory. And can I say, uh, the book of Matthew is to let the Jews know the Messiah had come. You see, if you talk to most Jews tonight, uh, they're still looking for him to come. They're still looking for the Messiah, but he's already came. We know that. Uh, and John tells us that he came unto his own, uh, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, uh, even to them that believe on his name. Uh, aren't you glad uh, he made a way uh, uh, for you and I, old Gentile dogs, to believe on him and receive him and become part of the good things of God? Uh, can I say every child of God that's been born again becomes adopted into the family of God? We now live in the grace age or the dispensation of the Gentiles of the fullness of time. Uh, we live in the time uh, uh, where the gospel, gospel can be preached, uh, can be heard, can be believed on. Uh, uh, sinners can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, be saved from their sins, uh, be washed from their sins, be placed into the family of God uh, uh, to become members of the bride of Christ. And one of these days, the Lord's going to take His church out of here. What a blessing. Can I say Israel has always been about the kingdom. If you look in all the Old Testament, Testament prophecies, they deal with the kingdom. Now, as far as we're concerned, we're not too interested in the kingdom. We live in the church age. The kingdom will be fulfilled and satisfied when Jesus literally comes back and rules and reigns from the throne of David and he rules and reigns for a thousand years. And when he's talking about the kingdom, he's talking about that time period, that dispensation, that is yet to come. Now you and I that are saved... Uh, We'll be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ and we'll be given our marching orders. Uh, we come back with the Lord Jesus Christ. You find in Revelation 19 uh, on white horses, uh, he lands on the Mount of Olives. He splits that mountain. Uh, he destroys the enemies of Israel. Uh, he sets up his kingdom and we will rule and reign with him forevermore. Now, what's very sobering, is how faithful we are in this life will determine how we rule with Him in that life. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be uh, much of anything in the eyes of a lot of people to be great in the kingdom. You just got to be faithful. Whatever He blesses you with, you're to be faithful. You know the parable of the talents. One He gave one, one He gave five, one He gave ten. The ones that got ten and five went and made more, they got blessed. One that went and made one, went and buried it. When the, the master came, he dug it up, gave it to him, and hey, he was wicked because he didn't do with anything that God blessed him with. Can I say the Bible says where much is given, much is required. Right. And you can believe this whether or not you want it. You sit in a Bible-believing church where the truth is preached and the truth is expounded on, and you're blessed to be privy of the truth. God expects more out of you than somebody goes to a church where the truth is never preached. Right. Amen. Mm -mm. And what you do with the truth will determine how you rule and reign with him. There are going to be some that are going to be rulers over cities and nations. And then there's going to be some that are going to be rulers over the dog catcher, of the trash collector. Hmm? They say, well, it don't matter how I live for Jesus. Oh, it matters a lot. And so he's dealing with the kingdom here. But can I say that there's a principle in this verse that is very important and very impactful that you and I have privy to. Because he is talking to his disciples 
And he is talking that he is going to give them something that will impact their world and for generations to come. And I'm interested in what he's talking about, those keys to the kingdom. Can I say that there are but three keys that I find in the Scriptures to opening the kingdom of heaven? Three things that will cause heaven to open up to you and I. And I say, most Christians, Brother Michael, they never tap in to an inkling of the potential that they could for the honor and glory of God. Don't you want to have everything God's got for you? With that in mind, I'm going to give you the three keys to the kingdom of heaven. Three things that will cause God to move into your little part of the world to answer your prayer, to do something for you, something special in particular. My dear friends, we can impact our world. It's up to you and I to put the key in the lock. You know, if you got here for Brother Randy uh, and you went to pull on the door, you wouldn't get the door open. You've got to have a key to open the door. Hmm? And can I say, the same applies to God. You just can't show up and say, I'm saved, God, here it is. There are some keys to getting into special places that God has provided for those who are willing to pick up the key to get in there, all right? Can I say the first key to the kingdom of heaven is the key of prayer. Prayer opens up heaven. You all know this verse, but you haven't listened to it in the context of what it really says. Now, I'm talking about opening the kingdom of heaven. Listen to this verse, Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. The key to all of that is prayer. You have not because you ask not. But if you ask, and you don't ask amiss, you don't ask to consume it upon your lust, but you ask for the glory of God, if you ask in Jesus' name, there's nothing He won't do for you. Hmm? The key to the kingdom of heaven opening up for you is prayer. It amazes me. Folks will give prayer requests. You want us to pray for you, but yet you never put the key in the lock to pray for yourself. Hmm? There is a avenue of prayer that opens this wonderful, wonderful access that we have. Do you realize that when you truly grab the horns of the altar in prayer that all of heaven hushes so God can hear you? He closes everything down just to listen to your voice and what you have need of today. But see, our God is so awesome and so omniscient, we can all pray at the same time. He still can hear every one of his prayers. All the noise of heaven, all the shouting, all the proclaiming of the seraphim, holy, 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 uh, all the uh, uh, angelic choir singing, uh, all of our loved ones that have went on that are praising the Lord, all of that is closed out in his mind so he can hear what you and I have to say. He has the key. The key to the kingdom of heaven is prayer. How much do we really pray? Now, I'm not talking about those now I laid me down to sleep prayers. I'm not talking about when you get caught with your hand in a cookie jar and you try to make a deal with God. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer. I'm talking about the prayer where he is given thanksgiving, where he is given praise, and then when you bring your petition before him for his glory to move towards earth. Can I say? We need the prayer of this kind of magnitude, a prayer for hearts to be saved and changed. When's the last time you prayed for God to change somebody's heart? See, the heart is deceitful. It's wicked. No man knoweth it, but God does. And God knows what it's going to take to break a heart, to cause it to be changed and turned. There are sinners that need to be prayed for that... God will break their hearts so they'll get uh, saved by the good grace of God. Uh, there are uh, wayward Christians that their heart needs to be broken uh, so they'll be brought back to God. Uh, and the key for all of that is for you and I to tap into heaven and pray that way. Hmm? 
Here's what we do, Brother Ed. We know people are dying and going to hell, but we don't put faces on them. We just think of these ghastly looking things going off into hell. We don't look at them as our neighbors, our, our loved ones. We don't look at them as uh, 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 the person that takes our money at McDonald's. We don't look at them uh, as, as somebody that works next to us or, or somebody down the street. Uh, uh, we just think of people dying on hell. Why don't we get a burden and ask for God to, uh, to break their hearts and change their hearts uh, so they get saved by the good grace of God? Uh, he might just change our hearts. Uh, and so therefore, we're giving them a gospel track or we're inviting them to church uh, uh, we're telling them about the goodness of Jesus. Uh, but hey, prayer changes hearts. Right. We need to pray for hearts to be saved and changed. Uh, we need to pray for a hedge around God's people. I want to tell you something. The devil's got a bullseye on all of God's people, especially them that are trying to do something for God, and especially them that are entering their prayer calls to get a hold of heaven. Get, the devil hates us, wants to take us out. So we need to pray for a hedge around God's people. Sure. And by the way, hedge is a wonderful thing in the Bible. And God will hedge us in and so the devil can't get to us. What a blessing. Uh, but I'm reminded that the Bible said, Whosoever breaketh the hedge, the serpent biteth. Uh, there's never been anybody fell to sin uh, that they didn't walk away from the protection of God. Uh, they broke a hedge, and as soon as they got out there where they thought the best life would be, uh, the devil bites them uh, and destroys their lives. Uh, we need to pray for a hedge around God's people. Hedge of protection. Hedge of blessing. A hedge of the hand of God on God's people. There's never been an attack on the church like there is today. The devil knows his time short. The last thing he wants is revival breaking out. The last thing he wants is you get broken hearted for sinners and you tell them folks about Jesus. Uh, so he's trying to keep all of us so busy, trying to keep our minds on everything but the goodness of God. Uh, he's trying to uh, so manipulate us and intimidate us so we won't do anything for the glory of God. You need to pray. Pray for hearts to be changed, hearts to be saved. Pray for a hedge around God's people. We need to pray for the house of God. Mm. Uh, I wonder how many of us really prayed, not only for God to show up and help us today, but for God to protect the house of God. I know we're busy, and I know we don't read the news, and the news isn't reported a lot, but do you know how many churches are being burnt down throughout the South? Do you know how many church shootings there's been? People walk in, just start opening fire. Do you know how many churches have had their air conditioning stolen? Do you know how many churches have been uh, 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 broken into and graffiti and foulness and wickedness uh, uh, sprayed all over the walls? Do you know it's only by the grace of God none of that's happened to us? Hmm? Now listen. I hope there's nobody in here got any, you know, doesn't have good sense. We never pay Russian roulette. Does everybody know what Russian roulette is? Russian roulette's where you take a revolver. It's got six chambers. You put a bullet in one. You spin it. And you put it to your head. And you click the trigger. You're playing Russian roulette that it didn't fall into a chamber. It's going to blow your brains out. Now listen, the odds are in your favor. But there have been people that blew their brains out playing Russian roulette. We pray Russian roulette with God. We just tempt fate. We just think God's going to be good to us. Most of us didn't even give a thought that we'd show up to church today and, the, and everything would be good. Right. We never gave a thought that somebody could have broke in last night uh, and uh, defaced the church. Uh, we never gave a thought that uh, uh, somebody could have set our church on fire. Uh, at least one thing I did not miss in St. Lucia that I got real equipped with when I got back home is sirens going off. Uh, there are more sirens that go off in Florence than I think anywhere in the world. Uh, there's fires, there's ambulances, there's police. Uh, I mean, I hear them all day long going off in Florence. Hey, what a blessing. They don't happen in St. Lucia. They did here. Uh, uh, but uh, at least we don't give that a thought. Uh, we really don't give a thought uh, that while we're having church uh, uh, some devil possessed person walk in uh, and just start shooting, shooting at our babies uh, uh, shooting at our church family uh, we don't give a thought we're praying Russian roulette with God 
Why don't somebody uh, put the key in the door? Uh, start getting a hold of God. God, we know it's by your grace that we get to have church. Uh, will you protect the house of God? Uh, will you protect the people of God? Uh, God, will you show up big uh, and do something in our midst tonight? Uh, I'm talking about praying. I'm not talking about bringing your shopping list to God and God, uh, 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 eggs is up, milk's up, gas is up. God, would you do something for our family? No, I'm talking about things that affect the kingdom of God. Uh, hmm. How much do you pray that God protect the preacher? We're blessed with good preachers in our church. But the truth of the matter is, there's only one pastor. Uh, and you can be naive if you want to, but if the devil takes out the pastor, there's a certain element of people that won't be back. Now, can I say that's wicked? That's out of the will of God? You should never join the church because of the pastor. You ought to join the church because God put you here. Uh? Now, you ought to join a church. It's important to be part of a church family. Uh? Uh, but listen, uh, uh, if something happens to the preacher, somebody shoots the preacher, the preacher's in a car wreck, uh, uh, the preacher has a heart attack, uh, that ought to not uh, affect your faithfulness to the house of God or your commitment to God. But there are people who do. They worship the preacher. Mm. Now listen, if something happens to the man of God, I think I've taught you well enough. You call a good man of God, and you get behind that man of God, you support him and love him and follow where he leads to, as long as he's leading to, 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 in the direction of the Lord. But if you put in a joker, you put in a booger, you put in a hireling, you ought to all walk up and get out and get away from him. Huh? Huh? Listen, there's a whole lot of preachers. There's not a whole lot of men of God anymore. Don't settle for anything less. You're welcome. Nowhere in my notes didn't cost you anything. You ought to pray for the house of God. And I'll say this. We ought to pray for our homes. Our homes are under attack. See, it used to be a well-known statement. So go the home, so go the church, so go the nation. Well, our nation's in a mess because the churches are in a mess because our homes are in a mess. Mm. We ought to pray for our homes. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to disrupt homes. Now, I know I'm getting old. I know I'm an old fogey and all that, but I remember when, when divorce was a taboo thing. Now divorce is a common thing. You know what's an uncommon thing? Marriages that last any length of time. Mm. Well, Somewhere not long ago, said, how long have you been married? I said, 33 years. They said, to the same woman? I said, yeah, nobody else had me. Huh? They thought that was the most unique, wonderful thing. I said, my in-law's been married like 55 years or something. You know? People say, wow, that's hard to believe. Unfortunately, it is hard to believe. Now, listen, I'm not thrown off on folks having a divorce. You're here and you're having a divorce. Well, I'm thankful by the grace of God you're still in the house of God. Uh, and I know not all divorces are wicked. There are some biblical reasons to divorce. Can I say from the beginning it was not so? But because of the hardness of the people's heart, God permitted a bill of divorcement to Moses. Can I say this tonight? A lot of our divorces, a lot of our problems in our home is because people don't have their eyes on God. We need to pray for our homes. There is so much attacks on our homes. Can I say your children are being attacked in your home and you don't even know it. Some of the video games you're buying your kids are designed to get your children's minds as far away from God as they can. Hmm? Some of the books your children are reading in your homes are designed to get your children's minds away from God. Hmm? Can I say that little electronic thing you carry around in your pocket? We used to make calls on them. Now they're everything but phones. Can I say a lot of that is manipulating people to get as far away from God as you can? You know, I, 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 I got a lot of pastor friends. You may not know this. Every Sunday morning, I send out a message to 200 preachers, most of them pastors. And we converse, and they get my little devotion. We converse, and 
And, you know, I have to turn my phone off by, by 8.15 or else I'll never get to church. I'm not kidding you. My, I, my phone blows up every Sunday. And if for some reason they don't get my message, boy, they're like checking on me. Preacher, you all right? Something wrong with you? You're not feeling well today? Didn't get your message. But listen, I talk to pastors. We talk. You know, I'm in a lot of meetings. and talk. We all face a lot of similar things. Now, you mark this down. You write it down somewhere because we get to heaven. You're going to look at me and you're going to say, Preacher, you were right. Now you're going to think I'm meddling. But you're, there's coming a day. You mark it down, Crystal. Get your pen out. I want you to write this down because you're going to say, Preacher, who's right? One of the greatest tools the devil has used to divide our homes is those little things called phones. Do you know how many preachers? I, we've had folks that came to this church this happened to you know how many preachers, we can all tell the same story. There's a home. The husband's not showing the attention that he should to the wife, or the wife's not showing the attention he should to the husband. They get on the phones. They find an old boyfriend or old girlfriend. Look them up. Start conversing. Start messaging. Next thing you know, uh, she's packing up or he's packing up a bag. Say, I won't be back. And they meet somewhere, the old, old flame. And that's happening all over America in Baptist churches. You can preach on the home. You can preach on what it's right to have a good home. But can I say, this flesh is wicked and people will do what pleases the flesh. There have been a lot of folks I've tried to preach the truth to, and they put cotton in their ears. They don't want to hear it. Uh, 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 listen, I had a message I preached years ago. They got what they wanted, but they lost what they had. Mm, there's a lot of folks. Listen, God made all of us with a will. God won't first force you to live for Him, but hey, you can follow your will. You can do whatever you want, but it comes at a price. Mm. We need to pray for our homes. The devil's got them constantly under attack. You know, one of the worst indictments in American culture is you got folks who are related to one another that don't have anything to do with one another. Now, I'm going to pick on Miss Tamara. She all the time accuses me of having my children under my thumb. She said, you all don't do anything that all of you can't do it together. You don't do it. That's, that's right. And she talks like that when I say it, when I said it too. No, uh -huh. I didn't get the wrong version. Say what you want to. I can't help it. I love my children. And I can't help it that we love spending time together. And I can't help it that they love me back. They didn't have a choice, but they loved me back, huh? Isn't that right, Squid, huh? Well, listen, we love spending time together. We plan our trips together because we like being together, huh? We plan events together. We plan dinners together, huh? Christian's a mama's boy. He talks to his mama more than he talks to anybody. I'm telling you, that's just the way we are. That's the way we roll. We just love one another, love spending time with one another. Unfortunately, that's not the norm. Huh? We sitting down at the, at the dinner table today. Mama fixed a big old meal. We was enjoying it. And she said, Dad had an idea. Sydney said, I'm in. She didn't even know what the idea was. Well, it's not going to work out this year, but we're going to try and do it next year. She said, Dad said for Thanksgiving, instead of killing a big bird and doing all the normal deal, why don't we go down to Brother Rocky's and serve a meal to the homeless people that come through there and just serve for Thanksgiving? Of course, there's a selfish element. She said, and then the next day we can go to Hamrick's for, for you know, Black Friday. <laughs> huh? Right? Mm, too close to me. Schedules conflicting everything this year. We'll just have to do it next year and take little Ella with us. Huh? But you know what? My kids are, yeah, let's do that. Most kids would never give up. Thanksgiving meal and getting with the family and all that to go serve a bunch of homeless people. But hey, we just, I just had it in my mind. I, you know, why not give back and be good to other folks that are down on their luck and in the process maybe show them the love of Christ? Amen. We need to pray for our homes. You know, it's only by the grace of God you're not being in a homeless line this, this year. 
Huh? And if, if if we put more Democrats in this this time next this time next year, we might all be down at Brother Rocky's looking for a meal, huh? We need to pray. That's a big key to the kingdom of heaven. Pray for hearts to be changed. Pray for a hedge around God's people. Pray for the house of God. Pray for our homes. But most importantly, we need to pray for Him. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. We need to pray for Him. We need Him. He's the only one to fix this mess. He's the only one that can help us. Uh, he's the only one that can protect us and provide for us. Uh, without Him, we have no hope. So prayer is the first key to the kingdom of heaven. And I say the second key to the kingdom of heaven goes hand in hand with prayer, but you don't hear, hear of it preached on much anymore. It's fasting. Mm. Now we don't like fasting because we like food. I like food. Matter of fact, I love food. Matter of fact, down there one morning, Brother Rocky and I was sitting there at breakfast. I had a big old waffle that this lady had made for me, and I had some eggs with some cheese on it, and I had uh, some hash browns, and I had some bacon, and I had some juice, and I'm sitting there looking at Brother Rocky, and I said, I love food. <laughs> you know what he said? He said, you know, he stutters a little bit. Go, but, 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 me too. Yeah. Uh, I love food. Fasting isn't about food. Fasting is becoming so enthralled with a burden and needing God on the scene, you don't take time to eat. We don't, we don't deal with fasting very much. Let me give you some, some verses. Let me give you what the Bible says. In Isaiah 58... The children of Israel, the priests and everything, had called for a fast, but they'd done it for selfish reasons. So God admonishes them for their fast, and he gives them direction for a real fast. Listen to what he says. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. It, is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this fast an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I've chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke. My dear friends, we need to fast if we're going to open the key to heaven to have the power of God and see results from God like we don't see. What kind of fast are you talking about? I'm talking about we need to fast for the wicked. The only way the wicked's going to be changed is if we get a hold of God. And we've got to get God's attention, and the way you get God's attention, it'll cost you something when you're willing to sacrifice something of pleasure or ease in order to show God you're serious. We need to fast for the wicked, he says, to loose the bands of wickedness. We need to fast for the weighted, it says, and to undo heavy burdens. There are folks that got burdens uh, 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 that we seem to pray about, but nothing happens with that burden. Uh, now it's time to take it to the next level. Uh, yeah, it's important to pray, but if that's not getting the job done, uh, maybe we need to fast uh, and uh, show God how serious we are about this burden. And I say not only for wickedness and the weighted, but also for the wronged. It said, and let the oppressed go free. The oppressed have been wronged. There's a lot of people been wronged by counsel of this world. Uh, a lot of people been wronged by other people. Uh, and uh, uh, the only way that the bitterness, the wrong is caused, can be removed might be for us to fast and get a hold of God. Uh, and I say we need to fast for those that feel worthless. It says, and that ye break every yoke. There are some people that are being controlled by other people. And the way that yoke is broken is not through kind words and giving them a gospel tract. Sometimes you're going to have to not only pray, but fast. Now, I noticed the shouting stopped when I mentioned fasting. Did you all notice that? Got real quiet in here. 
You know what it does to me when it gets real quiet? That means drive her home, preacher, drive her home. You're hitting a nerve. Knock it all the way out. Hmm? Can I say this? There have been times we've called for fast around here. And I'm not naive, Brother Ray. I know when I call for a fast, not everybody's going to take part. They're just not going to do it. Hmm? That crazy preacher, who's he think he is? Well, that crazy preacher is crazy, and he thinks he's a zero with the hole knocked out. But if God burdens my heart to call a fast, I'm going to call a fast because God said so. But can I say this? One of the most effective fasts that we've ever called for happened a few years ago in January when I called for a fast, not from food, but I called for a fast against the modern technology, our computers, our phones, those things. If you didn't need it for business, turn it off, get away from it. And take that time and replace it with reading the Bible, praying, and get a hold of God. We did that for a week. I was amazed at how many people said that changed their lives. I was amazed at how many people said, I did not realize how much I was on that thing. Uh, uh, some people said, I was just on it playing uh, computer games, but I didn't realize how much of that time was being taken from me uh, and uh, how much closer I got to the Lord. Uh, uh, when I turned that thing off and I just put my mind on Him, it changed me. Can I say that fast was so effective, Brother Ron? Revival broke out. Brother J.D. Walker come up for a Sunday and stayed, I forget how many days, but revival broke out uh, because people had been uh, uh, directing their attention away from things that numbed them uh, and directed their attention to Almighty God. Uh, and hey, when we came to the house of God that Sunday, uh, He showed up so big we just couldn't get enough. We had to have some more. Uh, that's what fasting will do. It opens the kingdom to heaven. It's a key to experiencing God in a light that we don't see very often. Amen. Mm, it's a tremendous key. Yes. I remember there's been times when we've just fasted for a Sunday instead of people going home. We just stayed here in the house of God. You remember? We used to put buckets out and put prayer requests in there. Uh, and we'd uh, uh, call for a fast. And we'd spend that whole day uh, in between services praying over the names uh, in those buckets and the needs in those buckets and the objects in those buckets. Uh, and I remember uh, our Brother Phil came to me. His wife was lost. He said, Preacher, can I buy a Bible and put her name on it and put it in the bucket? Uh, and when she gets saved, give her the Bible. I said, I think that'd be a great idea. Uh, uh, her Bible was in the bucket. Uh, somebody got to praying while we was uh, fasting. Uh, you say, what happened? She got born again. Uh, and we was able to give her the Bible. Uh, not knowing, just uh, not long after that, cancer would come and take her life. Uh, but thanks be to God, it can't take her eternal life. Hallelujah. I found whenever God has called us to fast... Whenever you give something up for God, He replaces it with something greater. Amen. And I found those times that we have fasted and we didn't eat, that He replaced it with spiritual meat that fills you a lot more than physical meat. My dear friends, Fasting is a key. Maybe the next key that we at the Emmanuel Baptist Church have to put in the lock to open the kingdom of heaven. Can I tell you something? It kind of scares me. I met this businessman on this trip. This guy sold out for God. I don't really know everything about this guy all I know is this guy does everything he can to see people saved and God blesses him big time he has built churches throughout South America I'm talking hundreds and thousands of churches He's built them in the Philippines. He's built them in Romania. He's built them in other parts of Eastern Europe. 
He's built churches wherever God opens the door, and now he's going to get involved in Christ and the Caribbean. He is all in. Now, I don't know a whole lot about this guy other than what he's told me. And that's why he told me, Brother Jim. He said, I can't wait to meet our CEO of, our, of my family's business. I'm like, okay. I thought you was the CEO of your business. Brother Clint, he said his CEO helped get Target started. He said there was times he was on the yacht and Target would send a helicopter to get him for a board meeting. Now, I don't know much about yachts, but one big enough for a helicopter to land on and a guy, I want to get to know this guy. You know what I'm saying? The guy went on to become CEO to Radio Shack in its heyday. Everybody remember when every mall had a Radio Shack? I miss Radio Shack. I don't know how many times you need a little doodad and you could go there and get it. Uh, now if you need something with electronics, heaven help you. You know, Meyer's got about this much over an aisle filled with, you know, a couple cords and same. I mean, Walmart a couple cords. I mean, and, and it's all grossly expensive. But anyway, the fellow that I'm talking about hired that guy at Radio Shack's heyday. The guy went to work for this guy. He said he's a godly man, came to work for me. And, of course, we know what's happened to Radio Shack. Listen, I've learned that God puts people in certain places and he blesses the business because of the person running it. Well, he said, you need to meet this guy. And so he's talking about, I'm thinking, this guy, that's his CEO. Well, then he gave me a little folder on some of their business, and, man, it's way above my pay grade. I couldn't understand a lot of this stuff on there. But I'm looking at the people that works for this guy, and I'm talking about these are some highly successful people. And this is what scares me. We're talking. He said, tell me about, you, about the church where you pastors. I'll tell him. I told him about you all and how good God had been in spite of the pastor and what God's doing, what our, our site is. And I told him we hope to build a building out here. And, and I told him, I said, I'm just waiting for, for God to give me the green light. I said, but we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to bite the bull. I know interest rates are up. I know materials are costing a fortune. I, I said, but I just, they're telling me $2.2 million. I just can't in clear conscience give $2.2 million. I think we can get it less than that. I'm trying to just wait on God and everything. He said, how much land you got? That's about six acres. He says, don't you have 20 acres around there you can buy? I said, you don't understand. Florence, they're buying up every plot to put an apartment building on, getting ready for Amazon to come. I mean, you all don't know this, but two weeks ago I got a letter here at the church. They're wanting to buy our property to put apartments on. said, y'all want to sell your property? We'd love to have it. I said, mm -hmm. I wear church. No, not interested. Well, anyway, he said, not 20 acres. I said, there's one plot of prime real estate in Florence. I said, it's 50 acres. I said, I know the guy who owns it. My wife used to work for him. He used to be a doctor. He's retired. I said, Walmart wanted it, and Florence wouldn't let him have two Walmarts in the city. I said, it's 50 acres of prime real estate, thousands upon thousands of cars right in front of it every single day. I'd love to have that. Put a church right there. Everybody would see where they I said, now they've kicked us off on a side row. I said, the property's $5 million. Here's what he said. He said, have you asked God for it? I said, I didn't have this meeting to get under conviction. I don't need to hear from you. That's what I told him. <laughs> I said, I've driven by it a lot and told God, God, if you want to give me that, I'd sure take it. They said, you might want to ask God for it. Sounds to me like we might need to be doing some praying and fasting. Because we're willing to do a little. God might be willing to do a lot. Now, I don't know about you, $5 million is way over my thought process. But not God's. We've always said we build another one, we're turnkeying it. We're both too old to do what we did 15 years ago. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you, some of you all just thought that was a pipe dream. I just met a guy. He could write a check and not even miss it. He was telling me about, uh, uh, he, he had this church in Nicaragua. He said the preacher forged his name and for, turned all the properties and everything. He said it was $500,000 worth of land that he took from me. He said, I don't care. People are getting saved. 
Somebody don't care about losing $500,000 at a whim. Hey, I need to know that guy, huh? He, he talked about that like me losing 50 cents in a car in between the seats. You saying that guy going to give us five minutes? That, might, that guy might never give us anything but a hard time. I don't know. But I know with God all things are possible. Yeah, right. And I know one thing for certain. There are keys to opening the kingdom, and part of it is praying, and part of it is fasting. And I may do some personal fasting. Lord knows I can eat. I, I could use it. But don't be shocked if I call for a church-wide fast that we get the mind and direction of God. I sure do want Him to open up and do for us what we can't do for ourselves. The third and final key to the kingdom. If you got quiet on fasting, you're going to dig a hole on this one. Go hide. The first one is prayer. The second one is fasting. The third key to opening the kingdom of heaven is giving. The Bible says in Malachi 3.10, that amazes me. You didn't have any problem when I read an Old Testament verse for fasting, but you got a real problem for an Old Testament verse for giving. But I told him that don't matter. The Bible's still true. Malachi 3.10 says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now with, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be, enough, uh, not be room enough to receive it. The third key to opening heaven is giving. Now I say that unreservedly amongst some of the most giving people that I've ever known. Brother Greg Phillips has told everybody far and wide. I mean, people know our church for giving because Brother Greg Phillips goes around and says, that's one of the top 1% churches in America. Them folks give more than anybody I've ever seen. I've never seen anybody gives like those folks give. Boy, what a testimony. I'll take that testimony. I know of churches that are known for splits. I know of churches that are known for doing heinous things. Hey, if we're known for being a giving church, I say bless the Lord, huh? But can I say, giving is a key to getting. See, God's math is a whole lot different than our math. Our mass says we got to save and pinch and do everything in order to amass anything. God says you start out by giving me a tenth, a tithe, and then an offering. And you wait and see if I don't make your 80, 85% go a whole lot farther than you can make your 100% go. It sure don't make sense, but it sure does work. Sure does. Hmm? Uh, listen, giving takes three things. First of all, it takes faith. I put my faith in what God says. It don't make sense. There sure ain't a whole lot of logic in giving. Doesn't, doesn't make sense that if I give God a tithe and an offering, and then maybe throw in a mission offering, and then maybe be good to somebody along the way, that God's going to take note of that, and He's going to bless me beyond what my non-giving would do. That don't make sense. But God said that if I'd bring my tithe in the storehouse that there might be meat in his house, that he would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that I cannot contain. Now listen, I can contain a whole lot. But it's just like when you've eat all you can and you've got to push the table away because nothing else goes in. That's how good God's been to me. Huh? There have been times I've said, Lord, yeah. you've been good enough. I just met with the deacons not long ago, and Brother Randy's right here, and not, I told him, I said, quit giving me raises. Didn't I tell you that? Well, you know, I don't know if he told you that. Y'all been too good to us. God's been good. He's been real good to me. Hey, it is a privilege to give anything to him. He gave his life for me. Uh, and the joy of giving begins with faith. I just believe God. Now, I don't have no seed of promise. I don't have this, uh, you give a thousand, God's going to give you ten thousand. No, I just, we'll just say this to you. You do your part, he's going to more than do his part. And I promise you this, you'll never outgive God. I mean, if the Jews uh, marched 40 years in the wilderness and their shoes didn't wear out, their clothes didn't wear out, God sustained them for 40 years. Bless God, he can take care of you and I. I promise you that. 
It takes faith. Then it takes focus. Hmm? Listen, if you're not focused, you'll lose faith. When I give to, to the Lord, that's exactly what I do. I give it to the Lord. It's all His. You notice there are no nameplates on our pews saying who donated this pew. I tell you who bought this pew, God. Because we gave back to God and it's His. Everything in here is His. Huh? We don't have a brag board. You see any brag boards with how much people give and all that kind of stuff? Uh, we do put it in the bulletin just because people, you know, it is your money. You have a right to know what comes in. We will give you a financial report. Uh, uh, we do that stuff just so you know everything is on the up and up. But the bottom line is the moment it leaves your fingers, it's God's. Right. Right. Mm. And I promise you we're going to do our best to be good stewards of it. And everything we try to spend, we try to spend for the honor and glory of God. We take on missionaries. I know people don't like how we take on missionaries. You just take on a missionary on a whim, yeah. I didn't even know he was coming today. But he's winning people to God. I want to be a part of that. And by the way, God's blessed us when we afford it. And I've found every time we take on missionaries, he just blesses. And Brother Randy will argue with me. Preacher, every time we do something good for you, God blesses the church. And we argue all the time, arguing. I finally got the way. Because I go places. I preach how to take care of the pastor. But I don't like preaching around here because you're all too good to me. Uh, so I finally got the key to shutting him up. I say, if you can get Miss Nett to sign off on it, we'll do it. Huh? He won't even talk to her. It's in the conversation. That's it. Uh, but I'm just trying to say you can't outgive God. God's been good. He is blessed. Look at this building. You know this building is about 17 years old. I've been in places that are three years old and they're falling apart. Because God's been good. And we take care of what God's blessed us with. I mean, it's in good shape. I was got to toying with making this all hardwood up here, but you know, carpet's still in good shape, so we're just going to wear it out, huh? But it takes faith, it takes focus, and it takes fortitude. God's going to get my money whether or not I need it or not. He's going to get it. It takes fortitude. Now, uh, can I say this? I'd never embarrass anybody other than Mary. But, but it's good to have Miss Janet here. I love, don't you love Miss Janet? Amen. She's so sweet. She loves the Lord. Now, you all know the last few years she's had some health problems. She hates missing the house of God. But I'll tell you one thing about this lady. She's going to make sure her tie's here. She will tell you, her brother got saved. She, she, put, she put the fear of God in his, her brother about, about tithing. And her brother had been off work for a while, been sick and everything. She asked him, she said, you've been paying your tithes? And she gave him some verse, said, you pray over that. You know what he did? He paid his back tithes. Hmm? But listen, here a couple, couple months ago, she realized she filled out her tithe check, but she hadn't put it in, and it horrified her. She said, Brother Doug, when I get to church, she called me. Brother Doug, when I get to ch church this weekend, I'm putting in my tithe. Don't you worry. I'm not going to owe, you know, meet God owing him any money. Uh, you know what that's called? Fortitude. Mm. When you realize the tithe is the Lord's, it's not yours, and you won't spend it on anything else. Uh, I'll let me help you some things. The blessings that come from giving. These are things that God just does for you when you're faithful to do your part. Can I say, first of all, the first blessing, you have an abundant life. I had a stepfather one time, used to tell my mother all the time, he said, you know, Doug could fall in a pile of manure, come out smelling like a rose. You know what he's saying? God's been good to that boy. He didn't know he was saying that, but that's what he's saying. Hmm? You have an abundant life. I don't, I don't apologize for how good God's been to me. He's been good to me. Do you know there's a verse in the Bible that if you forsake anything for God's name, if you forsake houses and lands or, and family, if you forsake that for His name, that He will repay you a hundredfold? Now, most of you know the story when I left the corporate world to begin pastoring, and, and when I came here, I mean, I didn't know, I don't know if you remember, Brother Clint, I didn't even know how to tell the men. I've been here two weeks. I didn't even know how to tell them. God broke my heart. I had to be full-time. He said, if we didn't go full-time, we wasn't going to get done what needed to get done. I looked these men in the eyes and told them, I don't know how to tell you the money's going to be here other than this is what God said. And every one of you said, well, let's do what God said. And the rest is history. 
Um, but can I say we started out, you know, Miss Nett lived, and I, we, we forsook a lot when we started pastoring. You know, back when I was in the corporate world, every time I got paid, she got a new dress. We only had Jordan, and that kid was rotten. We got him everything in the world. But can I say, when we stepped out on faith to follow God, we live in a house that the house we lived in back in those days would fit in three times. We drive better vehicles. We have two more children. We now have a daughter-in-law. We've got a grandbaby on the way. I'm telling you, we've got more than we ever had back in those days. I'm just telling to tell you, you can't outgive God. We live an abundant life. Now, can I say your spirituality isn't blessed on what you're wearing or what you're driving or what your address is, uh, but I can tell you this, if you put God first and you seek God's face, uh, 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 regardless where your address is, uh, you'll have an abundant life, you'll have a blessed life, uh, you'll have no regrets because God's been good to you. Uh, one of the evidences of a giving person, they have an abundant life. Can I, listen, I'm picking on folks, but I can't help it. I'm going to pick on them. <laughs> listen. But Tony, how long you been out of work? Seven years. Eleven years. I remember when he used to work for the, for the state. He used to be a janitor in the school system and worked hard and talked about people didn't work hard. And Then he went through a series about every six months. It seemed like he was having an operation after operation. Had some on his feet that really messed him up. And then he got a back injury that really, the back surgeon really messed him up. And he can no longer work. Been out of work eleven years. Now, Miss Brandy, I, I don't think I know this. You, you're not some kind of brain surgeon or something, are you? No, no. So you, you're not making, you know, a million and a half a year, are you? No, I didn't think so, huh? Been out of work 11 years. Now, you explain to me how somebody's been out of work 11 years, and this past year moved into Hanover Park over here. Huh? Move over here in the high rent district. You explain that to me, how a guy that can't even spell Hanover Park now lives in Hanover Park. Uh, now, I will say this about Brother Tony, and he knows I love him. He knows I call him Shrek and all kinds of other things. He'll admit he's not the brightest light bulb in the pack, but one thing Brother Tony's figured out is how to give and put God first. Yeah. Brother Tony's living an abundant life because he learned a long time ago you can't outgive God. Mm. Now, I, I'm going to tell you this. I'm just going to tell you. He drives this crowd over here crazy. You know these tithing envelopes? Look at that. You see these right here? They've got about six or seven things on there. Tony's will cover both sides. He might give to one missionary 17 cents. He might give to somebody else $1.83. He might, why don't you round it up, son, or round it down or something, huh? Uh, Thad has to take his shoes off to count all them pennies you put in there. But listen, hey, uh, he feels that it might not be much in your eyes, uh, but in God's eyes, uh, he said, give unto him, and he'd uh, uh, give unto you, pressed down, shaking, uh, bubbling over, will men give in your bosom? Uh, hey, it might not be much to you, uh, but it means much to God. Uh, and I dare to, for you to argue with me uh, how a man can be out of work 11 years, uh, but he's learned the secret of giving, uh, and now he's a reaping, uh, and God's a blessed him over there on Hanover Park uh, in a beautiful house. Uh, and God, hey, he's got more junk in that house. He ain't got two inches of wall for all the things God's blessed him. He's got hanging up everywhere. Why? Because God has showed him the secret to an abundant life. It's given. Hmm? I forget, I never forget last year, Brother Doug stood up and said, I wish you all could learn the joy of giving. You see, a lot of people want what everybody else has. You know how to get it? Learn to give. Hmm? One of, the, one of the secrets to that giving is an abundant life. Can I say? Another secret is you never have a need for an allotment of supplies. Can I say? There's never been a time I've went to the refrigerator and there wasn't something for me to eat. Went to the cupboard, there wasn't something for me to eat. Uh, you can see I haven't missed any meals. Brother Brian and I have learned the secret to not looking as fat. Put a vest on. I told him if he pops a button and hits me, I'm popping one back at him. <laughs> mm. You 
get, you never do without. Now listen, I don't eat filet mignon every meal, but I eat what I need every meal. Amen. Well, most of the time I'm eating what I like every meal. I've told you a story. When Annette and I got married, um, listen, we went around looking for, for an apartment for, you know, to get married, and we looked at some places I wouldn't send my dog to live in. I'm not kidding you. We was looking at places we could afford. <laughs> And then we went to this place over there off of what used to be Tanner's, which is now Ewing Boulevard. They just built them. It used to be called the Vineyard. I don't even know what to call them now. It's light blue. It's white. Now they're gray and white. But anyway, we was the first person to live in this part. When we walked in, I looked at this place, and it was beautiful. I just got out my checkbook, sir, right now at the post. She said, there ain't no way we can afford this place. I said, I don't, I don't care. We're going to afford it for at least a month because I'm getting this place right here. huh? <laughs> for the first year. We ate chicken, chicken, chicken. Occasionally some hamburger helper and chicken. I will eat chicken now, but not by choice. If you give me chicken and I can put some barbecue sauce on it, I'll eat it. But I, I, listen, I don't, I very rarely you see ever going to say, what do you want to eat? And I'm going to say, chicken. I ate enough chicken that first year to last me till the kingdom. Are you listening? Uh, but I never did without. Huh? Never did without. I'm telling you, God's good. You've got to learn the, the joy and the secret of giving. By the way, God loveth a cheerful giver. God doesn't love somebody griping and complaining while they give. Hmm? Huh? You know what else? Another blessing you get from giving? Answered prayer. Hmm? If you're not concerned about God's house, why should He be concerned about your house? Hmm? You know what else you get? And the blessing of giving, you affect the lives of others. Every time we take on a missionary, we give to a missionary, we don't know how many souls are going to be in heaven as a result of that. We're affecting lives. Every time we give out a gospel tract, you don't know how many lives that may affect. You know, I know in foreign countries, they say one gospel tract will be read by a minimum of six people. You never know how many lives we're affecting. We don't know. But we can give tracts. We can give Bibles over to jail. We can give uh, uh, materials out because people give to the storehouse. We have that privilege. We can take on missionaries because people give to the storehouse. You see, the church was set up long before I ever came that 10% of the general offering goes to missions. Well, that wouldn't cover a fraction of that board up there. But there's a lot of people not only give their tithe, they give a mission offering. And uh, that helps go to those missions. But, you know, Lord's blessed our general, off general fund offering so much, we just transfer some over to mission. Keep taking on missionaries. Uh, and every time we take on missionaries, God blesses because we're affecting lives. See, our Jerusalem is this area. Judea might be Union and Hebron. And, uh, but the uttermost parts of the world, we can't go to. But somebody's going there and we can send them. We can get and uh, be a part of that. It affects the lives of others. But listen, well, the greatest blessing of giving is we're annotating or exemplifying Christ. He gave His life that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He left heaven, came here, and gave Himself for us. And when we are a faithful giver, there's nothing we do that emulates Christ more than that. Giving of ourselves. Now, here's the danger, Brother Brian. A lot of people will give what they think they can afford. When you learn to trust God and give what He says, that's when the real blessings come. There are people in this church, I'd never call them out, never embarrass them, that do things in the shadows that nobody knows but God, and they give. And folks' lives are changed. People are getting help. And friend, there's, there's nothing better than that and showing the love of Christ through giving. Three keys to opening heaven. Prayer, fasting, and giving. Let me ask this question. I'm done. How much of heaven are you opening? How much heaven am I opening? Mm. We talk about the floodgates getting open and revival come. He might be putting the key in the lock. I want to challenge you. Ask the Lord how you can be better at opening
heaven for mankind. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. When he comes, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, I know in our salvation we bore no part. It's all of you. But in our Christian life, we have a big part. A big say of submitting our will to your will. Lord, tonight I know we branched in things you don't hear much on. But there are ways for heaven to be open, and you pour out blessings that most of the time we never see. God, give us a burden. God, help us, Lord, to put these keys into use. Help us to open the things of heaven for now and all of eternity. Lord, bless in this invitation now. Help folks to take inventory of their life. And God, help them to be instruments that impact this world. God, we've got a great church. We've got some of the most loving, giving folks that I've ever been associated with. But Lord, show us if we can do more and how we can do that. Lord, we certainly pray for somebody not saved. Lord, you've spoken to their heart. I pray they'd come get saved. Lord, I pray for somebody that's got anything between you and God. They'd come get that thing made right. Lord, we don't want to stop up the windows of heaven. We want the blessings of heaven. So God, now bless in this invitation. Speak to hearts and glorify your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.